Evening, everyone. Michael Lake from the AFDCS Education Department. Um, welcoming you all to this presentation for the month of February, almost out. So very pleased to welcome Trisha Richmond, who has a terrific presentation that I've gotten a sneak preview of on the 1932 Washington Bicentennial issue. Um, it's one that I actually collected when I was uh, when I was starting out as well. So uh, she has done significant more study on it than I ever hoped to do. So um, I know that this will be enjoyable for everybody. We'll save questions until the end, as always. Uh, so feel free to have those saved up. And uh, with that, Tricia, I will turn it over to you. Good evening. Doing this presentation this evening, about the Washington Bicentennials of 1932. Start with how and why. In 1925, Calvin Coolidge was the president and he created the Washington Bicentennial Commission to celebrate the 200th anniversary of George Washington's birthday, which would occur in 1932. The commission uh, launched with a bunch of politicians, causing a bunch of ruckus and a lot of historians. The historians created, among other things, a five volume history of George Washington's life. But it was still only 1925, with seven years to go. So interest sort of petered out and arguments developed and other things. So in 1930, the President Hoover sort of re energized the commission by promote, uh, promoting a smaller committee that he thought would be more of a working committee. And uh, their, their commissions were to plan the stamps that would be released, coins, uh, medals, which were sort of uh, non-monetary medals, and all sorts of pamphlets and guidelines that cities would use to promote pageants and plays and other things for communities. Uh, one of the things that happened almost immediately was that they wanted to release a coin for Washington's birthday. And they uh, wanted to do a half dollar on the design of uh, the Oregon Trail commemorative half dollar. But the Mint said, no, they had too many of those already in stock. They didn't need any more half dollars. What they needed was a replacement for the Standing Liberty Quarter. And so the quarter that we still are familiar with today, the Washington Quarter, was released. In fact, they print, they minted so many of them in 1932 that they didn't need to mint any in 1933. This is one of the results of that commission. And you'll notice that the, the corner address card of this says the United States Commission of the Celebration of the 200th anniversary of the birth of George Washington. Now this is a invitation to a play that was produced by the commission and was sent to prominent people in Washington, DC. This one is from a scrapbook I got of things of Senor Gonzalo Guell. He worked for the Cuban em embassy in Washington, DC at that time. Later on, Guell was rather famous because he was later a UN, US ambassador, a UN ambassador. And he was one of the 40 people who escaped Cuba in 1959 on Batista's plane. So he was one of the last people out of Cuba when Castro took over. And it's rather tattered because unfortunately it was glued into a scrapbook, which was pretty common in 32. Now the Washington Bicentennial Stamps, which is why we're here, at first, in 1930, the, po uh, the post office started making plans for these, and the committee wanted big, flashy stamps like the 1983 Columbian Exposition stamps. And they thought they would originally uh, consist of large format stamps and range from half cent to five dollars. This is one of the preliminary drawings that was proposed. This one's by Livingston for a half cent stamp. And I got this image from the National Postal Museum online. And they have several other proposed that were 
proposed and rejected designs. The, the thought was that the larger format paintings they were using for original purposes were not historically accurate. And since there were so many historians on the commission, they were rejected in favor of smaller images of just Washington. They decided to select famous paintings for a different one for each stamp and reduce the size to smaller stamps. So although these are commemorative stamps, they are what we can consider definitive size. This is the most recognized image and it's by the Anthenium painting by Gilbert Stewart. And so it was proposed for the most used rate of two cents, which was the first class letter rate. And it was definitely, it was Carmen because that was the accepted rate, the accepted color for the two cent rate. <clears throat> January 1st, the stamps were issued. There were 12 cents ranging from half cent to 10 cent. Those are stock numbers 704 through 715 and they issued five stamped envelopes, one cent through five cent, U523 through 525 and U527 through 528. The two cent on both are Carmen Red for the ease of the post postal clerks to know that this has paid enough for the first class rate and the blue five cents on both of these are the blue, which was the airmail rate. The Washington Bicentennials were the largest set of stamps issued on the same day and up through 1932. The Columbian Exposition set was larger, but they had different dates. The fact that they were all issued on the same date caused some planning issues for the post office. They were expecting the the collectors to really be interested in all these first day covers. But manpower was a bit of thing. Up until then and afterwards, a collector could send in an envelope and their coinage or their dollars. The post office would apply the stamps and send it postmark it and send it back to them. But in 1931, in September, the Postal Bulletin made an announcement that the, that the Washington Post Office was not capable, didn't have the manpower to do that for these stamps. And so they would have not apply the stamps for this issue for first day cover collectors. They went on to, in the postal bulletins, they went on to tell people to pursue advertisers in philatelic publications. And three of the most popular ones at the time were Meekles in uh, Maine, Lynn's in Ohio and Stamp Collectors Magazine in Virginia. So many, many printers of first day covers produced caches for this issue, both ones who had previously been printing caches and new, new people. Malone's Cache Covers Volume 3 lists 111 different caches, eight general purpose caches, that doesn't include varieties such as typeface and odd colors. And of course, as always, there's some that are not listed. This is number one in Malone's. It is the Rossler Cassays. The one on the bottom is considered 1A, even though the, the one I am showing is not a first day cover, it is a second day cover because the first days were only in Washington, DC and they were not supposed to postmark January 1st covers any place other than Washington, D.C. This is a Pittsburgh on January 2nd. Some people consider this a first day for Pittsburgh, but however you wanna consider it, it's the second day it was issued. The one on the top is considered 1B because it has a fancy, bo fancy border. And I, while we're on this page, I want you to look at the machine slogan cancels. There are three that were the most prevalent that I have seen on these issues. The top one says address your mail, street number. The bottom one says notify your correspondent of change of address. And the other one is register or insure your mail. So 
the ones that went to the machines generally had one of these three slogans. The one on the top says 3 p.m. The one on the bottom says 5.30 p.m. I've seen them up to like 11 o'clock at night. So they were doing this all day, evidently. Number 15 in Malone's is the Stotzenberg caches. Stotzenberg did two different caches for this issue. The top one shows Mount Vernon. The bottom one shows three portraits, Washington, his wife, and his mother. The Mount Vernon uh, variant at the top is not listed in Malone's. It seems to have acquired a three-line rubber stamp below the cache, whether that was applied by the recipient, Eric Johnson, or is was applied by somebody who sold it to them. There's no way to tell. The bottom one is a variant is 16, but it's variant A because it has this fancy airmail border. At the time, airmail borders were considered were red and blue. They weren't consistent of being any specific type at that time, but they were red and blue. The top one has a machine. The bottom one has a, a hand console. And this one says not, they both say 9 p.m. One of the reasons why there's so many Malone, uh, caches listed in Malone's are companies like Aeroprint. Aeroprint sent their caches out as airmail first day covers. So the airmail rate was five cents. The top one has the two and the three cent. The bottom one has the five cent. I want you to remember the, ca the cache at the top. We'll talk about that later. 24E has the, the, the logo type of Washington with a hat. You'll see why I'm asking you later. And the bottom one has, is 24G. More varieties, the top one, instead of airmail, is special delivery, and it used the 12 cent special delivery rate. And the bottom one, one of their many varieties, for some reason, they used a picture of Thomas Jefferson instead of George Washington. Whether they did it intentionally or they didn't know the difference, whatever, Thomas Jefferson's on this cover. Eeyore did is number 20 in Malone's, and he did 12 basic types of these. Now it's a series, there's 12 stamps, he did 12 caches, but as a collector, I have seen all sorts of stamp varieties on all sorts of caches. It doesn't seem like there was any great um, consistency as to which stamps went on which covers. The bottom one, Washington's inaugurated is 20L, the top one is 20C Washington at Yorktown. While we're here, I'll note that the Yorktown stamp was 701. And it's not uncommon for these caches to show a previous stamp that related to Washington. Uh, the 701 Yorktown and the, the Scott number 645, which is a Valley Forge stamp, show up on a lot of first day covers as combinations. Now, Malone's number 13 is the Washington Stamp Exchange. The Washington Stamp Exchange later became known as Artcraft. They have, the top one is 13 and it's blue. 13, the, the, the middle one is 13, but it's red. As far as I can tell, there's no difference in these caches other than the color they're printed in. The bottom one doesn't have a border around it. And the typeface above Washington is larger. It's considered to be 13A. But this one also has a second rubber stamp. There are two other varieties in Malone's from Washington Stamp Exchange that I do not have. And you'll notice that these have a variety of, of franking, one cent, nine cent, three cent. And that's not at all unusual. It's, it's, it's not unusual at all to find any of these caches with any of the stamps. Now, Joseph Feigenbaum is number 61. I'm showing this one because it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of, it's mostly text with a little bit of a bust of, of Washington. There are at least 10 varieties. Nobody is certain that there's only 10 varieties. The only difference in these is that the, the black type is different, telling a different part of Washington's story. There's 61F and 61K, and there's obviously eight more varieties. To this point, I've never seen them all sold together, but I do note that these are addressed to the cachet maker. Now, 
Earlier, we saw one with multiple caches. This one is also a multiple cache. It has the, the hands, the rubber stamp in the top left corner. And uh, Malone's calls that rubber stamp cache number 81. They do not note anywhere that the red and blue customized border as a cache. They list it as part of another cache, but not as a separate cache, even though this is customized for the George Washington stamps. Uh, first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. I had to look it up because I didn't know where it came from. It was from a it was from Washington's eulogy written by uh, Light Horse Harry Lee. Just a second, I want to draw your attention to the fact that first day covers were not always printed just by people who printed first day caches. They were usually done by people who did printing for lots of different reasons. It was their, their profession. Illustrations that you see on these are often sold as like typeface so that they could, uh, a metal piece that they put in just like print. I've never seen a full catalog that sells the typeface from 1932, but I did manage to get a brochure. Now these bro this brochure was sent to people who, who would be doing the printings and you'll note that the images, it'll tell like the first one, it says that it's a large one and it's sold for $2.10 or they could get the one color version for $1.20. The reason I point this out is in the middle of them, you'll see that one with George Washington and his hat. And this may be where Aeroprint got the image. I have seen the, the first image and the middle one used several places. I've seen this one used. Some of the others I haven't seen personally, but I bet they're out there somewhere. This one is from the American Type Founders Company. I thought it was just interesting because it sort of related back to how they got to be the way they are. Here's a different cache. It's from L.A. Beebe, who I had never heard before, before I got this envelope in my hand. It's sort of a generic Washington with a frame around him and words. It's printed in two different colors, black and brown. But it's interesting because the normal back stamp got printed on the front. It took a day to get from Washington to New York City. And then when it got, I mean, to Ham, New Hamburg, New, New York, and then it uh, was forwarded into Albany. But the original destination's back stamp is on the top. Even today, I'm not sure we get there in a day. This is A.E. Schlater and William Hausman. And this is Malone's number 76. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason about how they got put into Malone's popularity or alphabetized, or they just seem to be in there. Uh, this one is uh, sort of an ordinary one, but it is a first cache by Slater and Hausman. And uh, it's printed in, you can't really tell on the screen, but it seems to be printed in two different colors of brown, of brown ink. And the design they used is seems to be, it's different from everybody else's. It's got more facial expressions and shadings. So they may have done it themselves. Hyman Metzler also did a first cache. You'll also, you'll note that he also addressed this one to himself. It's not something that I have seen more than this one of. He uh, has sort of a generic George Washington that's a, kind of tilted. Whether he did more caches after this one, I don't know. Now, those were all done on, a, on printing presses. When I first got this one by Julian Bach, I thought, gee, it's purple. It was done on a mimeograph machine. But that's just because of the age I am. But as I started checking into it, I found that it was done by hectograph. Now, a hectograph used sort of a special inks and a tray of gelatin, and they were done one at a time. And it's obviously hand-drawn with flags and letters and, and writing and stuff. And this one's addressed to himself. I managed to get five of them at once. They were all identical with identical franking, and they were all addressed to him. So they obviously came from the same source. And I don't know if JB here, Julian Bach, 
address them all to himself or not. But the only ones I've seen are. Anyway, I saw the image from Wikipedia that shows you how they did it. Another thing you'll find on these, on these covers is that they often use poster stamps or Cinderella stamps, however you want to term them. They were uh, non-postage stamps that were used either in addition to a cachet, instead of a cachet, to seal the envelope on the front, on the back. I've seen all sorts of different varieties. The, uh, the ones that say Virginia, the first American colony, there are many different ones. There's only three cities here uh, represented, but I know there's more. I think there's like 10 or 12 cities represented, but I haven't seen them all, obviously. The one, uh, the green one is sort of metallic, sort of like a, a, a stiff metallic foil. And then the, uh, the pink, pink and purple one, I've seen in different colors. And it was just sort of like printed on paper and cut. The, the thing about these poster stamps that I wanna mention is that when you see them on a first day cover, often you can't tell whether they were added before or after or much later than the cachet was produced. This is one of the uses of a poster stamp on the back. This is John Gill, first cachet. You'll notice the image of George Washington in the red and blue is the two color from the typeface cachet folder that I showed you earlier. It's very nice cachet. It's done in two colors. And uh, on the back, you not only see the hand stamp, but you see a purple rubber stamp and a Cinderella that says, come to Washington. And they note that the Washington, you know, they, they say, come to Washington February through November, which is originally what the post office envisioned that all of the event covers would range from February to November. There's something that a collector, at least I, always try, you know, dream about getting, and that's a whole series of first day covers, all addressed to the same person. These are all addressed to J.A. Hosnick. They're a complete set of all of the covers. And this is the first cachet of Leslie Kerr, Malone's number eight. They all have this lovely Cinderella on the back that mimics part of her design on the front. Whether Leslie Kerr is responsible for all those other Cinderella's, I don't know. And I don't, I'm not sure anybody at this point does. This one, uh, instead of showing Mount Vernon, this shows Wakefield. Wakefield was George Washington's birthplace. I find it remarkable that at 90 years later, almost 90 years later, the whole set is still together. And I have another collector to thank for making sure that I got these like they are. Now, the first uh, volume three of Malone's only showed the cachets for the stamps, 704 to 715. To get the cachets for the stamped envelopes, you have to go to a different Malone's, Malone's volume four. The thing is, is that some of these are the same cachets that are in the other volume, but they're not numbered the same. So a rice cachet in one volume will have a different number from a rice cachet in the other volume. There's just no consistency whatsoever. This is a Carla Rose cachet. And whether my ignorance or whatever, I'd never heard of Carla Rose before, but she was rather prolific as a cachet maker for this issue for the Washington Bicentennials. And this is the large, we call it a, a number 10 envelope now. They use different numbering systems then, which I still have not sorted out yet. This one, uh, the cachet for the 704 to 715, the stamps, is almost exactly the same, except it has a different, instead of little pluses, it has a different border around the, the wording. Here's the Rice cachets that I mentioned. This is the first issue that Rice did, a cach did cachets for, and he did two different ones. Now, it isn't the typical scalloped circle that he later became usual for. 
in this one, he, uh, the top one, he did Mount Vernon, the bottom one, he did Wakefield. Now the Mount Vernon is U523 cachet number three, but, and it's listed as in black only. Malone's listed as in black, mine is blue. Whether it is blue from fading, blue from toning, or it really is blue, it's up for some further research. The bottom one, which is uh, Malone's three is black. It's also known to exist in blue. So I assume the, the top one is also known to be in blue. It's just an uncatalogued variety. But so whether it's a three or four depends on whether you're looking in Malone's volume three or volume four. So this, these issues couldn't be confusing enough without just a little more added. Now I mentioned uncatalogued FDCs. This one is made on an envelope from the Southern Hotel, Baltimore, Maryland. Now remember I said that the post office wasn't applying the stamps. A lot of cache makers took it upon themselves to go to Washington. Some of them had to spend someplace overnight and a hotel would have envelopes available. So it could just have been a coincidence. They said, these are available. I'm gonna use them to make covers with. But as it turns out, the Southern Hotel was erected on the, the site of the famous old fountain inn of colonial days where George Washington and his staff often stayed. And it would not have been, un, this information would not have been unknown to the person who made this because there was a big plaque in the lobby of the hotel. The hotel no longer exists, but there's quite a bit of information about it online. And I have seen at least three other hotel stationaries that were used as first day cover. Here's one of these that the longer I looked at it, the more confused I was. This is cache number 31. A cache 31 or number nine, depending on which book you're in. It is un unattributed as to who made them. However, mine all say on the back, New England Philatelic Exchange as a return address. I have different types of envelopes used, but they all have the return address. Now, I have 10 different ones of these purple ones, of the purple stamp, but Malone's only listed as available in green, a green stamp. It doesn't say anything at all about the purple stamp, but I have 10 different ones and I've seen some recently on eBay. So the purple ones are pretty prevalent. I also have three of the postal stationaries that are in green. Part of the confusion may have been that the address was printed in green and it may be sort of a typographical editing error. These, this one is uh, franked with 17 cents, which over franked for the registered, registered mail, I believe. Now, hand-drawn cachets were as popular then as they are now. They're, for this issue, they can be extremely expensive. This one is on, it's addressed very faintly to Dr. Vores on the front. And on the back, you see his return address, which was his pre-stamped uh, stationary. Whether the cachet was added before or after, there's no way of knowing. It has a little label, a uh, common label that was used at the time for airmail. And they drew in with colored pencils, the, a red and blue indicate airmail with the five cent that, that was the airmail rate. My personal opinion is that the doctor did not do this himself because while it's, it's sort of done in a sort of a doodle-ish with a black pencil and bicentennials misspelled. So let's hope the doctor was a little more literate than that one. This is one of my more interesting ones. I posted it on Facebook and got a lot of discussion about it and I posted it in an RPO Facebook chat room and I learned a lot about railroad post offices. It is from train three of the Washington and Grafton post office, railroad post office, which means it was a rail car. 
where they did the post the, the postmarking on board the train. It is cached by a rubber stamp. And this is one of the known unofficial cities for the January 1st, first day. And it's considered another city mostly because there is really no way to tell where the train was at the time it was postmarked. It could have been in Washington, CC, and it could have been on its way towards Indianapolis. When I get to this point, I want to tell you that this was sort of the end of the examples that I've shown you for the January 1st cancels. And people who were first day cover collectors, only first day cover collectors were sort of like, had this big hype and all of this activity and all of this glory and now it's over with. There were also, I wanna point out that the event covers that, that were collected were perhaps more collected at the time than first day covers. February 22nd, Washington's birthday, our neighbors to North Canada issued a, an overprinted airmail stamp, which this collector, Charles Rupp, sent off for. He got it since it was Washington's birthday. Obviously tie in, he got it. He put a, he put a cachet on the back of the, the purple hand stamp. And then he got his friend at the post office to uh, postmark it with a favor cancel for, in Allentown as a receiving stamp. I say a favor cancel because the two cent rate would have been the obvious rate for a letter. There really was no use for a half cent stamp other than to use with other things. So he paid his half cent and got a friend at the post office to postmarket form. And I've seen several of these that people customized. So even though it is not a U.S. first day cover, it's been tied into the Washington Bicentennials. The Canadian C3 stamp had several different, uh, I think it had, I think it had two different cities that it was issued in. There could have been uh, several people uh, collecting and doing the same thing. On eBay, where prices were more than I was willing to pay. I've seen these that were hand painted for, for George Washington's birthday. All was going really good. The post office was happy with the stamps and the collectors had all their stamps and they were all settled in until June. Now, June, the post office announced that there was gonna be a rate change. They were gonna raise the rate from two cent to three cent on first class mail and increase the airmail set uh, price from five cents to eight cents for the first ounce. And while I'm saying this, I will say that the second ounce for airmail was, was like 20 something cents or something. They really didn't want airmail to be more than an ounce. So they announced it in June that they were raising the price on July 6th. And these are event covers that were done at the time. The bottom one is a generic, you know, first day of rate at the three cent. And it shows the three cent purple George Washington stamp from the series. The one at the top is the last day of rate and it is customized with George Washington. And it shows the last day of the two and five cent rate. I've seen hundreds of these. And many of them are customized for George Washington or for the Olympic stamps, which also came out that year. Now the 708, the three cent purple, the, the peel painting was not popular with uh, post office customers. They didn't like the painting. And so since the post office was raising the rate, they realized they didn't have enough uh, three cent stamps already printed to accommodate the supply that they would need. So they were going to have to print more stamps anyway. And they decided that they would change the th a, a three cent design. So they used the Stuart painting that everybody liked and they made a three cent purple three Stuart. And it was uh, the first issued in on June 16th. And since they were doing that, they also 
did a stationary. And of course it's purple also, because as I mentioned before, this helped the postal clerks do their sorting. They could, at a quick glance, they could tell if it was, had enough postage on it. And it was also issued on the 16th of June. Now this is a first day cover for number 720. And it is a cache by Eeyore. And uh, this cache was also used on July 6th as a rate change cover for an event cover. And it does come in other cover, other colors. I've seen it as sort of a purple and gold, I think. And uh, the slogan cancel it still says address your mail to street a number. Here's the 526. This is a, a rubber stamp, an oval, sort of a generic one. It is uh, the first cache I got of this uh, U526. It is uh, a number six envelope and uh, sort of not, who knows what it, who, uh, who did it, but on the, it does have a return address, Domo Shell Art Galleries in Detroit, Michigan whether they are the creator or the sponsor or just the person who sent the letter in, I don't know, but one of those things that never quite figure out. Now the demand for the three cent stamp, at the beginning when they issued the, they were very obvious in their statements that they were not gonna issue coils or booklets for the Washington Bicentennial stamps because they were not definitive stamps, they were commemorative stamps, but when they got around to the three cent, they changed their mind. June 24th, they issued the horizontal coil, which is the one in the middle. July 25th, they issued the booklet. And in October 12th, they issued the vertical coil. You'll notice these pictures show different colors of purple, of violet, and the stamps are the same. If you spread them across your table, you'll see they're all different shades of violet. It was it, I don't know whether it was a control issue or that's just the way it was, I don't know. But the, the stamps do show up in different shades from red violet to medium to darker violet. Now, June 24th, this is the, the horizontal coil. It is a, a generic cache. I mean, it's a patriotic appropriate for Washington, obviously, but it's a generic cache by eGolf. And uh, I have seen it in this black. I've also seen it in blue. Here's another one of the horizontal coil. It, it's only got one stamp instead of a pair. It is the Eeyore and it's in purple and gold, like I mentioned earlier. It is postmarked June 24th, which is the correct date. And it was uh, postmarked on the US Frigate Constitution, which was in Washington, DC for the, the, the Constitution's uh, trip down the East Coast. It says Washington, D.C. in the, the bars, but it's considered a, an unofficial city, but it is a known unofficial city, meaning I'm not the first to discover it. It's listed in uh, this checklist of U.S. first day predates and unofficials, 1922 to mid-36 by Colby. If anybody's never seen this booklet, which I had never seen it until I started looking for these, uh, it's available from the uh, First Day Cover Society's uh, uh, website. And it's very interesting. 720B, the booklet pane. Now, obviously when you put six stamps on a First Day Cover instead of one, the price is gonna go up. The only one I've been able to afford so far is this one with no cachet up at the top. July 25th through the 27th was the occasion of the Society of Philatelic Americans Convention, the 38th convention evidently, and it was held at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, DC. So this one on the left has a pair of George Washington horizontal coils, and it uses the convention's rubber stamp as the cache. Malone lists this as cache number one, I assume because it's most prevalent, well, whether that's true or not. And it does list it as magenta. I have found this cache in a non-George Washington, with a non-George Washington stamp 
someone used it at the convention and they had a green rubber stamp. I assume that green rubber stamp also exists for the George Washington 720B, but I don't know. This one here, I said coil. I meant it uses two stamps from the booklet. This is the bottom, bottom uh, third of the booklet page. The 720 is the, uh, the date for the booklet page. Anyway, I thought that was interesting, cited philatelic Americans. Now we get to the, uh, the vertical coil. The vertical coil was issued on October 12th, which is Columbus Day. Fairway did uh, caches for the earlier stamps, and it is not unusual for these later issued stamps to use some of the same cache envelopes. Since it's October 12th, there's quite a few of them out there that show the crossover between this stamp's issuing day and Columbus Day. I have several of these Columbus Day caches, but not with the 722 franking. I, at the bottom, I show two of these general, general purpose Christopher Columbus caches that were made by Eeyore. There's two of them. I know he made at least eight different ones, and that was just one cachet maker. So there's a lot of Columbus Day cachets out there, and a, I'm sure a good majority, a, a good portion of them have the, the 722 stamp on them. So it depends whether you're looking for an event cover or first day cover. It takes a, an eye to look for them. Now, in case you're counting, that brings the total of stamps issued up to 15 stamps, plus a book of pain, and six stamped envelopes with four different first days of issue for the, stamp, for the series. Here's the kicker. The other Washington Bicentennial stamp. Poland issued a stamp May 3rd, 1932. Poland, in case you're not aware, Poland and the United States had, I won't say close ties, but they had quite a few ties diplomatically at the time that went back to the American Revolution. Their stamp shows Kosciuszko, Washington, and Pulaski. Kosciuszko was a military engineer who fought in both Poland's and the American Revolutions. Pulaski was a Polish Hussar, who became known as the father of American cavalry. In fact, he died in the U.S. Battle of Savannah in 1779. So this is a rice cache of Mount Vernon in blue with the Polish stamp. And they always show the, the postmark from Poland is always 3V for, for May and then 3219. And everyone that I've seen says Warsaw, well, it says it in Polish, Warsaw at the top with an X at the bottom. They all, everyone I've seen looks just like this, and they're often just as blurry as this one is. Now, the last one I will show you is probably my favorite one. This is January 1st, New Year's Day. This uh, cachet maker or collector, Andrew Lobstrom, used stationery that was holiday stationery to make his caches. I have like seven of these with different franking that he used blocks of forearms so are very attractive covers. And I just like the fact that they're different. And this is one of those later ones in the day too, because it was postmarked at 9 p.m. And evidently he had his address printed on them and Lakeview Station isn't a station, it's a uh, apartment complex, I believe. Now I've listed some references in case you're interested in doing some more research on things that you have. If you're more interested in the event covers and the first day covers, which are, there are thousands of them out there. Uh, this catalog, 1932 Bicentennial, any Bicentennial Event Covers by Courtney and Edelstein. I'm not sure it was ever published. I have not been able to find this book or purchase anywhere. It is available from the APS Library, which is where I checked it out and, and got the information from. 
they do reference some older references that uh, they used in the beginnings of, of the research that I was able to find, and they are the United States Historical Cover Catalogs of 1934 and 1935. I've managed to acquire both of those at extremely reasonable prices on eBay that were published by Brennecke. Now, the illustrations in the Brennecke catalogs are few and far behind between, it's mostly just a line or two describing them. The Courtney and Edelstein has lots of nice illustrations, but they do not talk about first day covers. They only talk about event covers. There is a presentation on the American First Day Cover Society chapter 56's webpage where I gave this talk the first time. It is a slightly earlier version or feel free to email me, Macintosh caches at verizon.net. This is something that I am still ongoing, collecting, working on, researching. And if you know things I don't know, I'd like to hear from you. Or if you've got something you want to ask questions about, that's fine too. Trisha, thank you so much. I'll uh, open it up here. Anyone can uh, unmute and feel free to uh, fire away with any questions that you have. I have one for you, Trisha. Okay. The um, the American uh, typeface catalog that you showed with the um, uh, with the images on there. Yes. What else were those images used for at that time? Well, not only was the uh, the uh, George Washington Committee producing pamphlets about celebrations that they were encouraging the the local people to put on but many of the states were printing stuff. They would, they would print it all sorts of booklets. And I've seen there was like seven or eight of them published in just New York City. I know Baltimore published them and these all had to be printed. So I assumed that these illustrations were used for not only the caches, but were used for all sorts of other things that were printed. Uh, the other thing, one personal note I can mention about the pageants and plays is that in 1932, my mother was a first grader. She told me the story once that her elementary school put on a pageant for George Washington. And I imagine that was a very common occurrence. 1932 was depression time. You made your entertainment yourself. And I, she told me that uh, the kids were all dressed up in period costumes. And like many other families during the depression, her family was extremely poor, but her mother was a very talented seamstress. And she made arrangements with another mother who purchased the fabrics and my grandmother made the costumes. That's terrific. Sue Jones? I see your hand raised. Yes, uh, I have a question about the Stoutzenberg cache. Yes. Cover. Were those uh, red and blue lines forming the border, were those printed on the cover or hand drawn? Printed, I believe. They appear to me to be printed. Okay. I've seen that same border on some other envelopes. Not necessarily first days, but I have seen that same design border on some others. Yeah, I've got it one much later, but the ones I the one I have are hand drawn and colored pencil. So I was just curious. It could be an imitation of this one. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I saw Marjorie's hand. Oh, thank you, uh, Tricia. Uh, this was a very fascinating uh, presentation. And I am curious why you included the, the three cent sort, uh, Scott number 720 and et cetera, as part of the Washington Bicentennial commemorative issue. Oh, well, to me, they are 
together because they were all issued during the 1932 year. They're not part of the original stamps, true. But the great thing about philately is you can do whatever the heck you want to do. Uh, to me, they go together. I know other people don't. Uh, it's the same way when you collect the 32 event covers, you sort of draw the line. Well, this one's talking about a, you know, an airport. It doesn't really go in, but the person next to me may think it does. To me, they go together. I know you, Marjorie, I know you've written some articles, which I've read recently yeah. about uh, this issue. And uh, I sort of assumed everybody put them together, but I do. Oh, okay. Thank you. Wayne, I saw your hand. I have a comment. Uh, I collect the uh, 32 change of rate, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the purple three cents. And uh, uh, I don't consider it as part of the bicentennial, which I also collect. I have uh, probably in the neighborhood of 3,000. Uh, different uh, cache event covers, uh, one for every day of the year, actually. And, uh, but uh, the, uh, the, the change of rate uh, is definitely not part of the bicentennial. Uh, Scott does not consider it a, a commemorative stamp. And, uh, so, you know, I don't either. I do. Isn't it nice to be able to disagree? Uh, the, uh, the event covers are very, very prolific. There's lots of them from all over the country. For anybody who hasn't really thought about it. I started my bicentennial collection as sort of a COVID hobby. And it has blown up into many loose leaf not volumes now. But uh, it's not something that I've been working on all my life or anything. It's just sort of a relatively recent interest. But I agree that many people consider the original stamps, the series, and the others sort of an add-on. How do you how do you feel about the the postal stationery, Dwayne? Uh, there was also a uh, regular issue postal stationery issued the same day as as the seven uh, twenty as, as the three cent stamp, mm -hmm. uh, and and that was the the definitive postal station. Uh, however, uh, the bicentennial postal stationery uh, issues were, I believe, all on different dates. No, they were, they were on, on January 1st. Were they on January 1st? Yes. And they, they came in three different sizes. Yes. Yes, I have many of them, all of them, in quantity. Mm -hmm. Actually, I bought the uh, uh, a collection from Jacques Minkus. Uh, 40, 50 years ago, uh, and it was of first day covers, I think uh, 135 different caches and uh, uh, 1,500 different event covers. So I've been collecting them for several years. So this is a new obsession for me, a new hobby. Right. Hello, Tricia. My name is Tim Waite, and I collect the bicentennials also, but I collect them more from a commercial usage. I just wanted to let you know I, I met Mr. Courtney just last month, and he's working on a new catalog for all oh. the event covers. He's working updating the catalog, and Dwayne, you're helping with that too. Right. It's a it's very useful reference. Mm -hmm. 
then you mentioned the airmail rate was more than five cents for the second ounce. It was 13 cents. It was more. It was 13 cents. Yeah, yeah the second, thing, second ounce was expensive. Yep. There are some of those uh, bicentennials that you almost never see a single usage because their usage is rather odd. Yeah, the seven center is probably the hardest one to find on a solo use. Mm -hmm. The five cents rather easy because that there's a lot of uh, letters that went to Europe. Yeah. Five cent airmail, right? Well, Mark Senti wrote a whole series of articles in the U.S. Specialist uh, over the last couple of years on the solo usages. If anyone collects that, they ought to get a copies of those issues. And and it's just a tremendous variety out there. I don't collect them, but it's amazing that the usages that could be done for those stamps. DA Lux just handed me a few of those uh, those uh, publications at our last chapter meeting and said he thought I might find those, uh, find Marjorie's uh, articles interesting, which I did. If you need any, any other ones, let me know. I'll send you copies. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Tricia, for a uh, terrific presentation. Really appreciate it. And uh, to everyone, we'll, uh, we'll see you soon on the, uh, on the chat. Thank you. You're a good audience. <laughs>